everyone doing? Oh my gosh, welcome to Discovery. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Pastor Veronica. Who's excited to see the other Hanish? Anyone? Okay, good. I'm so glad. I hope you weren't disappointed. Anyone disappointed that I'm not Pastor Jason? No? Great. See, I knew it. I knew that I was the favorite one. And if you don't know me, tonight you're going to know me. I am truly the better half. I am the better half. I am. Um, You know what? I am really excited about sharing tonight. I just feel like, man, God is doing something so special here at Discovery. And I know he's doing something special in your life, even if you don't perceive it. I hope tonight you do. So, you know what? Let's give it up for Pastor Jason. I really do appreciate and love him. He's such a great husband, pastor, friend. I mean, he's truly who you see on the stage is who you we also see at home. Points and all, everything is in order. It's like when we're going to eat, how we're going to eat it. It all has like points to it. It's super awesome and organized. Okay, so <laughs> I'm not lying, you guys. I'm not lying. All right, so look at your neighbor if you have a neighbor. If not, you can look at me. Um, and tell your neighbor, this is going to be a great message, and it's for you. Amen. Amen. It is. It is for you. Sometimes we try to, like, hear messages, and we start to filter them through this idea of, like, oh, you know, am I going to really listen to this chick tonight? Or can I start thinking about what I need to do when I get home? Don't check out on me, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Amen. I like when people say amen, too. Can you all practice right now say Amen. Amen. All right. Okay, good. So let's get started. We're going to read a chapter in Luke chapter uh, in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 through 21 where Jesus is talking here and this is what Jesus says. He says the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed, everyone say anointed, me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, if you have notes, please take those out. If you have your Bible, please turn to it. The Word of God is so incredibly sharp and amazing. You want to make sure that you have your notes out. So the the title of today's message is, A Power I Didn't Know I Needed. A Power I Didn't Know I Needed. So earlier this year, um, Pastor Jason and I rolled out this idea that this would be the year of freedom, right? And so like most of you, I started to go to God and started to write down the things that I knew I needed freedom from. Some of the things on my list might have been things on your list too. Things like, God, help me not to want to eat tacos and pizza all the time. Please, Lord, I need freedom from that. Come on, everyone say amen that you know what I'm talking about. Okay, or maybe some of your things were on the list, and I'm not lying, and if you don't say amen to this, I know you are lying in church, and it's not right, is that I ask God for an easy year. Like, Lord, give me the year of freedom. Like, let this year just be, like, free from issues. Like, the, the year of free from crazy things, random things coming up. Let me have 12 months of just free sailing. Don't lie. You know, you if you didn't ask God, you wished you would have because I asked him for it. So far, four months in, we're doing pretty good. And, and but, but really, we can, like, go to God for these things. But really what I, what I asked him for, if I, if I can be honest with you and vulnerable, really, because even from the stage, I can, we can be vulnerable. And I hope that as you sit there, you can be vulnerable with me. And ask yourself it, it, if it's the same thing that, that you did that I did. Did you also go to God and say, God, I have some really heavy things that I've been carrying for a long time, things that I have tried to get free from and I just can't, and and things that I have brought before God, like, God, help me be free from these things. Help me to find freedom from these things. And then I, and I can't. It's like going around and around and around in a circle, trying to be free from some things. And so immediately God replied to me as I was praying and asking him here earlier this year, almost as if he was like, shut up already. Like, I'm trying to answer you. Like, immediately. You know when you get that immediate answer from God and you're like, whoa, that was fast, God. I thought it needed to cook a little bit. You know, I thought he would respond somewhere else. But immediately as I was praying here in January, he, re- he replied to me. And he shared this scripture of Luke 4:18. He shared with me how he was the anointed one who could break the bondage, that he was anointed to help the poor break free. He was anointed to help the blind recover sight, both spiritually and physically, both emotionally and physically, all of those things. 
But then he really hit me hard when he hit me with Isaiah 10, 27. And he says, Isaiah 10, 27 says this, And it shall come to pass in that day that the burden shall be taken away off thy shoulder and the, ne- and the yoke off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed. Everyone say this with me. Because of the anointing. Because of the anointing. And it rocked me because I was immediately, even though I knew what the anointing meant, I immediately went to my work to figure out what exactly the anointing meant. I mean, I went and I digged through the Greek and the Hebrew terms and, and what did I need to f- truly be free this year? If it was the anointing, what does the anointing really mean? Now, what we hear God saying is that because of the anointing, our burden lifts and our bondage is broken. So we hear that if, that God says because of the anointing, our burden is lifted and our bondage is broken. Because of the anointing, our burden is broken, our burden is lifted and our bondage is broken. I'm going to say it one more time just in case you didn't hear me. Because of the anointing, our burden is lifted and our bondage is broken. Because of the anointing, our burden is lifted and our bondage is broken. Yes, please. Let's give, let's give an applause to God. Because, uh, because of his anointing, because of the anointing, our bondage can be lifted. Our burden can go. It can be broken. We don't have to live with the things that we continue to go around the mountain with. So if you started the year off, the year of freedom, and you played with what you asked God for, or maybe you didn't even dare ask him because it was too hard to even go there, I want you to revisit that conversation again. It's not too late. We still have nine months to go, or a few months. I don't know math very well. (laughs) It's not too late to ask him. I believe that God wants to tell you what he told me that day, that he doesn't want you to just live in freedom this year. He wants you to live in a victorious anointing that he has on your life. Yes, amen? Amen. Say amen as you receive it. That he wants you to walk not just in freedom, but he wants you to walk in a victorious anointing that he has over your life. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. I love those amens. So here we see that Jesus says that there is a power available for us, and it's called the anointing. So before I explain to you more about what the anointing is, first let me be very clear about what the anointing is not. Because we often hear messages or podcasts or sermons, which, by the way, be very careful on what you're listening to. Be very careful, sheep of the house of discovery. Be careful what podcasts, be careful what websites you're looking things up because it's very, very confusing in a world that is that is very distorted and it, it will lead you th- to do and think things that are not God's word or God's truth. So let me be clear to you what the anointing is not. The anointing is not a religious act. It is not a religious act. The anointing is not something that happens on Sunday from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. and you have to wear white and it's only for leaders. And it's something where you stand on your head and you do these little, like, you know, these weird hand movements or anything like that. That's not what the anointing is. It's not some religious act. Secondly, it is not a talent. It is not a talent. It's it's not a supernatural talent that helps people sing like Whitney Houston. Amen? Amen? Because there are plenty of people singing in cruise ships and in nightclubs that sound just like her, and they do not have the anointing. They do not have the anointing. It isn't the power to just have a great message and get on a stage or get it behind a microphone and have a talent. It is not the anointing. Do not confuse that and do not allow the world to confuse you between the anointing and the talent. It is not that cheap in Jesus' name. The third thing is, is that the anointing is not permanent. If you walk away from God, guess what? You lose the power in dwelling in you. That's it, period. If you want the anointing, you keep God in you. If you want to walk away out of disobedience and rebellion, if out of pride, if following your own way suits you better than following God's way, you will lose your anointing. It's not that God will rip it from you. It's not that he will take it from you. 
There's, 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 there's Old Testament stories that talk about the anointing leaving people, but it wasn't because God just said, you know what, I want it now, now, now you don't have it, now you have it, now you don't. It's not like he's flipping on a switch on and off in your life. No, he is saying that there is a power in dwelling in you. Why would you walk away in disobedience to God's ways in your life? Why would you choose to walk away from it? Those examples that are in the Bible are not because God just chose to flip something on and off in someone's life. But it was because someone chose disobedience, chose to do things their way, not God's way. Amen? Amen. Sorry, I might offend you today. I am the one that will offend you. The Hanish that will offend you. Pastor Jason will not. I will. Okay? You're welcome. Okay. So, lastly, the anointing is not just for certain people. It is not just for certain people. It isn't. I love the anointing is for everyone. It is for every person, no matter what you do. If you are in first impressions, the anointing is on you, and you can have an anointing there. If you are in the kids' ministry, that's the most anointing, I would say. (laughs) I would say if you serve in the kids' ministry, God loves you a little bit more than anybody else. That's just my saying. It's not the Bible, so don't get confused. But I do believe, I do believe the word is very clear, that there is not a special anointing because you stand behind a microphone. It is not special anointing to stand on a stage, that there is an anointing to do every part of your life, whether it is mothering or going to, um, you know, pick someone up to give them a ride to the church. There is an anointing in what God is calling you to do. Okay, so now that we know what the anointing is not, amen, everyone say amen. You guys are tracking, okay. Now let's talk about what the anointing is. So here's my definition, according to God's truth. The anointing is the power and the presence of God in your life. Amen. It is the power and the presence of God in your life. If you want more of the power and the presence of God in your life, say amen. Amen. We all want and desire to have a greater anointing. We all want and desire to have a greater level of freedom, a greater level of freedom for our family, a greater level of freedom for those people that we love, for the things that are in our hand, for the responsibility and the things that we have. Well, guess how you get that anointing? It's by having the power and the presence of God in your life. And you can have different measures of that. You can have different closenesses, a closeness to God in that. But guess who chooses that? You do. You get to choose that. So when we ask God, God, give me more. Give me more of this anointing. It's like asking him for something that isn't, it, it's like plugging your vacuum cleaner and say, man, I hope this, or not plugging in your vacuum cleaner and then trying to vacuum without it being plugged in. It's like saying, man, I hope this can go on turbo. And you start like clicking the little buttons. You know, have you ever done that? And you're like, man, what button is it on? Because you, you know, the little thing rubbed off on your vacuum cleaner. You don't remember if it's on carpet or the floor and you're like, which one is it? And you're like, God, I want to go on turbo. And you're trying to press the button. And you're like, My, God, I want more. And you're trying to turn your vacuum cleaner on, but it's not even plugged in. You're not even connected to him. You're trying to use things in your life that he's given you as gifts. You're trying to be a better father, a better mother. You're trying to get free. You're trying to be healed. And he wants all that for you, but you're not even plugged into him. Come on. Amen? Amen. I like you guys. All right, Acts 10, 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good. Everyone say doing good. And healing. Say healing. All where were, and, oh, sorry, all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. It is a power we need. The power that was in Jesus lives in me. The power that was in Jesus to do good, to heal, and to deliver whatever oppression or possession of any demon or whatever, the devil, that was in him is in you. So when your husband acts possessed or your children are possessed, you don't need to call Pastor Jason. Is that good news? Come on. Come on. You don't need to call the, you don't need to call the prayer hotline. You don't need to call, um, you know, your, your aunt so-and-so who's the prayer warrior of the family. 
You don't need to call your leader. I mean, call them, yes, for, for all the love and care and support. But you have the power. The same power that was anointed and in Jesus is in you to, to overcome the devil, to heal. How many of you want some healing? Amen. How many of you want to overcome the devil? Amen. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That power's in you. Amen. Okay, so we see that is in him. So we need to say that when rain comes, when the rain comes on the just and the unjust, that we got a power. That when life kicks us in the face, because amen, it kicks us. Anyone been kicked in the face before by life? That when, when that happens, that you have an anointing, a power that will be greater than that. We need the anointing. We need the power in the presence of God at a greater measure in our life, more than you know, more than you understand. Amen? Amen. All right, so practically speaking, how do we access this power? How do we understand and process practically in our life the anointing? Okay, number one is we receive the anointing. We have to receive it. We have to receive what the Holy Spirit has for us. We have to receive and accept it first. 1 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22 says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit, um, or his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Guarantee. Everyone ever, ever heard that before? I forget what movie that is quoted in, Pastor Jason. Um, guaranteed. You, you have a guarantee in your life of this anointing. It, all you have to do is receive it. It's something that is freely given to you. It's because Jesus, it is because of Jesus that we have the Holy Spirit, not because of a talent or a gift. You don't, you don't have an anointing in your life because you did something to deserve it, but because you accepted Amen? Amen. I like amens. Remember that. All right. And then 1 John 2.20 says, but we have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have, and you have all knowledge. So here is the good news, that you have been anointed by Christ, and have you received it is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Have we received it? If you have been anointed with this power, think about it, the power to heal the power to be able to walk in the fullness of everything God has for your life. Have you accepted it? Have you received it? The second thing is we need to grow in our anointing. Because maybe you've accepted it. Maybe you said, yes, God, like, I want the fullness. I, I, I'm walking in obedience in my life. I want everything you have for me. But there's this growing part that stunts you. How do I grow my anointing? I'll tell you what, it's not by just listening to more podcasts. <laughs> it's not by doing more good things. It's not enough for us to just receive the anointing. We actually have to grow the anointing, increase the increasing power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. So Ephesians 4.13 says this, Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So here is Paul talking, and he's talking about how, like, the church is here to build up. And right before this verse, in verse 12, he's talking about, like, he's giving us different gifts to do these different things in the church. You all are a part of the body. You all have a gift and something that you are supposed to be a part of, Holy Spirit gifts that you have. But he says that we have this measure, and everyone underline, um, if you have notes, underline whole measure. We all have this measure, but there's a whole measure that we can receive. That means we can continue to grow that anointing. We can continue to grow our fullness, to our, grow the anointing till we are full. Amen? Amen. All right, Acts 4.13 says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that, they, that these men had been with Jesus. You can tell if someone is close to Jesus when they are anointed. You can tell. It's not the difference in the talent. It's not the difference in, in what they say, but you can just tell. 
you could just see it from a mile away. They don't even have to say anything. Moses, they said Moses, when he came down from being with God, that his face was lit up, that there was something so bright about it that you couldn't even look at him. You don't even need to say anything. You don't need to perform anything for people to see that you have been with Jesus, that you are anointed. Amen? You can see it in people. I, I, like, it, I like to say it like this. The closer you are to Jesus, the more anointed, anointing you will possess. The closer you are to everything that God has for you, the closer you are, the more intimate you are the more anointing you will have. Now, let me say this, too, as a caution, because I sometimes see this in the church, is that if you feel like, man, I want this anointing, I want to be, I want to walk in a greater level of anointing with God, so what I need to do is I need to stop serving because I need to read my Bible some more because I, I, I just need to be, I just need to be alone. Pastor Veronica, I need to stop serving because I want that more anointing like you said today. So maybe I need to just pull back from what God has for me right now so that I can just be alone with Jesus. Let me caution you, those in the room who want more of an anointing. You are drawing closer to Jesus when you serve him. You are drawing closer to the Holy Spirit probably more closer than reading or doing anything else when you are serving like Jesus did. When you are being the servant, when he himself came and Jesus himself said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. You are being more like Jesus in those moments than you can possibly understand. So why would we stop serving him to draw closer to him? Do you hear me? To be closer to him, to draw out of the anointing and the oil that flows from the Holy Spirit, we need to draw closer to him, and it doesn't mean pulling back from serving him. Amen? I told you I was going to offend you just a little bit. Okay? All right. And then thirdly is we need to protect our anointing. Oh, my goodness. We need to protect it at all costs. At all costs. Our relationship and our connection with Jesus needs to be protected at all costs. It needs to be something that we see as very, very important on the list of lists. In the Old Testament, we see Saul, who was king, and he was loving God and, and doing the things. God placed him as king over, the, you know, over Israel, and he was the king. But then he did something he wasn't supposed to do. Saul went, and he took things. Out of the, you know, they were at war, and Saul, God told Saul, don't take anything. Leave all that stuff there. Make sure you just kill everything and leave. Nope. But now what he did. He took some stuff. He did some things that God told him not to do. And the Bible says that the anointing left Saul. That the anointing left Saul. Again, not because God flipped off a switch and said, you know what? I don't want Saul anymore. I want David. I like David better. He has a slingshot, and he's cool. No. No, that's not what happened. He disobeyed God. And God cannot use a vessel who is not going in the same direction as him. He cannot put a yoke on you and go with you in your life and where he has for you if you are not going with him. And then we see poor Samson. Everyone say Samson. Gosh, he was really messed up. Samson was so strong. And he had this great calling in his life. And then Samson met some chick named Delilah. Or, come on, men, you know what I mean? Men, come on. It's not always what it looks like. Delilah makes him cut his hair, breaks his Nazarite vow, and then wakes up one day and he tries to walk in the same strength that he had and the same anointing that he had. And guess what? The Bible says it's gone. And that he didn't even know it was gone, which is even scarier for you. Let me tell you, you might not even know that your anointing is gone. Because like Samson, he didn't even know. He tried to get up the, that next morning and still be the man walking in the strength and the anointing, and it was gone, and he couldn't. 
Because he fooled himself in thinking that breaking the rule, breaking the, and being obedient to what God has in your life is not going to affect you. Because you take small steps back, and small steps back that don't affect things, and you don't see the immediate, like, result of stepping back from God. It's just like, I'm just not going to, you know, not pay my taxes, or, you know, I'm just going to not show up. I'm just going to lie a little bit. I'm just going to not obey that. But God, I love you, but, 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 your butt's in you, and place that you didn't expect amen they do they they make you do things and think things and you wake up someday and you're like why am I thinking this way how did I end up here you're like Samson and you wake up and you're like where did my power go I thought I just cut my hair for this chick and we were gonna like hit it off and have a great time he thought he was there for a short time and a good time I don't know. I'm speaking to somebody. Okay. All right. So we can lose our relationship, and we need to protect it. So in the, on the Old Testament, we see Samson, and, and, and we see um, Saul. But in the New Testament, when we see Jesus, we have an anointing that is protected by God's grace, and we can't lose it unless we walk away from it. And we have to protect it. And these are two ways. That it can come in and start to cheapen and lessen the anointing that you have in your life. And the very first one is, and you better keep this far from your life, is strife. Keep strife from your life. Keep it far from your life. The Bible says if, if if you are able to live at peace, man, live at peace. If you're able to, to not have this strife, do all that you can for that. Here in 1 Corinthians 3, 3, Paul is saying, You are still worldly. Paul is talking to the church. He is not talking to the outreach group on union. He is not talking to the person who does not love or know Jesus. He is talking to you, my friends. He is talking to us. And he is saying, you are still worldly since there is jealousy and quarreling among you. Are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? You are not operating in the power that you have if you are being worldly, meaning you are doing things your way. You are doing things that you you think should be the right decision. Like, God, I know that you tell me that, you know what, that I shouldn't sleep with my girlfriend. But I know that you said that I should should serve you, but I, I really am in a season that's kind of busy. So if I can put you on hold, or, 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 or God, you know, Lord, I love you, but I hate my neighbor. I hate my sister. I can't stand my mother-in-law. You cannot have both of those things. You cannot have the anointing of God and then not protect it because you have strife in your life. You cannot hate your mother-in-law <laughs> and then have the anointing at church. You cannot be mad and call the police on your neighbors every other day and egg their house. <laughs> I don't know. Does people egg houses still? I don't know. I used to do that when I was a teenager. I, um, I shouldn't have said that out loud. Okay. All right. Anyway, but you cannot. Amen? Amen. The second thing is we need to guard our thoughts. Everyone say guard your thoughts. Proverbs 4.23 says this. More than anything you guard, protect your mind. For, it, for, for life flows from it. Protecting what you think is protecting what you believe. Let me say that again. Protecting what you think is protecting what you believe. We need to protect what we think by protecting what we believe. If we start to begin to believe the thoughts that we think, then we will f- be, be far and stray very, very far from our anointing. We will not be protecting it. We need to protect what we think. And then lastly here is we need to transfer our anointing or transfer your anointing. Paul says here in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, And these things you have heard me say, meaning the preaching, the podcasts, all of the messages that you have heard me say, Timothy, listen to me. I want you, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust this to reliable people 
who will also who will also be qualified to teach others. I want you to not just keep it for yourself. I want you to not just walk in the anointing so that you can be healed. He didn't tell me and he's not telling us today in this year that he wants us to walk in an anointing for our own freedom. He wants me to be free. He wants you to be free. He's telling us that he's not just going to help you walk in freedom this year. He's going to help you walk in victorious anointing. Is that not good news? It's up to you to receive it. It's up, for you, up to you to grow it. It's up to you to protect it. And then it's very important for us to release it and transfer it to other people. I'll tell you why. Everyone say this and even write this down if you need to write it down. Write I am a temp. You're a temp. Everyone know what a temp is? Ever seen The Office? You're Ryan. You're right on the office. This is what you are. You are a temp. You are temporarily here. You are a temp at your job. If you're the owner of a business and you thought, oh, this is my business. I started this business. It's all about me carrying the load of this business. No, I'm sorry. You are a temp. You are an owner that is temporary. You are a supervisor that is temporary. I am a pastor that is temporary. We are about to build a new building, and me and Pastor Jason will spend less time there than the next pastor will. They, will. they will spend more time in a building that we will sacrifice for and build than we will. We are only temporary. We're the temp pastors. You're the temp at your job. You're the temporary mom. You're the temporary dad. You're just a temp. We are made to not just walk in the anointing for our own freedom, but we're made to transfer this anointing to the other people around us because when we are gone, if we did not transfer it, guess what happens? The gospel dies. It dies with you. It dies with me. If I do not transfer that gospel, if I do not tell someone else about the good news and, and, and do what, what happens here in Exodus, let me show you this because it's so, so good. So good. Exodus 30, 22 through 32. It says... It, it, it explains, like, what happens to, to the anointing in the Old Testament. This is not a law or, or a, a tradition for us. This is something that happened in the, the, the um, Old Testament, but I want to use it as an illustration for you today, as an example. Here it describes so incredibly, like, specific, down to, like, how much of what needs to be used. It's kind of like... The ingredients to the recipe. How many of you like cooking? Raise your hand. How many of you follow the recipe to the T? Okay, that's great. I don't. I don't. So I'm just going to list the things really quick that it lists here in Exodus on how to make this oil. It's talking about this oil and how it, it is used in the Old Testament to anoint things. Okay? So in Exodus... Um, chapter 30, verse 22, it starts and it says, okay, you're going to use fine spices, you're going to use liquid myrrh, you're going to use fragrant cinnamon, you're going to use some cassia, and then you know what, you're going to put six quarts of olive oil, about a gallon and a half of olive oil, so a big jug of oil, this is how you're going to make it, and then in verse 26, it says, then you're going to mark these things, and you're going to get this oil, and you're going to mark the tent, and then you're going to mark the ark of the, the law, then you're going to mark the, the table, you're going to mark the articles. You're going to mark the lampstand. You're going to mark the, you know, the accessories at the altar. You're going to mark the utensils. Are you kidding me? They, like, anointed the fork and the knife, you know. <laughs> they anointed the basin that, that, and with its stand. They anointed these things. And some of you are marks. And you feel good with that. I'm marked. I have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to, you're going to be in heaven. You love Jesus, you're marked. You have that Holy Spirit. You're like these holy things. And, 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 and you're set apart and you're marked. But then it goes into verse 30, and it says that then they take, uh, um, then they said, anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointed oil for generations to come. 
Do not pour it on anybody else. Now he's saying, again, this is something in the Old Testament. He's saying, don't, don't do this to anybody else. This is a sacred thing that I do. This is for the, the Levite priest. But guess who he now calls the priest? Who does he call the priest? Does he call Pastor Jason the priest? Does he call Pastor Sean and Pastor Brennan because he leads worship the priest? No, he calls you the priest. You now in the New Testament, you now and under the Christ, under the, the precious blood of Jesus, under the Christ the Messiah who came and saved you, he calls you the priest. You are the priest. And what he wants the what he wants to happen here is he says, This is for you, this is holy. And he says, do not make any other oil using the same formula. It is sacred. And it is to be, it is, and you are considered, you are to consider it sacred. You are sacred. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy people. You are special. You are carrying in you the gospel of Jesus. In you, there is power to heal, to recover sight to the blind, to help your family when they're in need. To overcome any devil and any lie. Amen? So I want to show you an example of how me and Pastor Jason are transferring our anointing. We have um, Cooper, who is going to come up here with me and help me out. Where's Cooper at? He's coming. Cooper's coming. And every I have chosen a person to do this to every service. Everyone say, Amen, if you weren't the one I asked, because you don't have to do this. Cooper, let's give it up for Cooper. Cooper. Thank you, Cooper. Um, I asked Cooper, and I asked someone for each service, who I know is called, who I know loves God, and he loves God's church. As a matter of fact, his grandfather, is your grandfather here? He's not. So his grandfather, Wayne Mead, was a pastor of a church. And I believe that Cooper someday will be a pastor of a church. He's a, he's in, he serves on our young adult team, and he loves God's church. If I just walk in my anointing all day long, for as long as I live in my temporary job, and don't understand that I need Cooper, and that I need to transfer this anointing to him, and that I need to make sure that he understands it and walks in it, so that when I'm not around, he can be here for that church. And he can be there for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren as well. So what we're going to do is I'm going to not only show you the physical illustration of what happens, but I'm actually going to anoint him for real. We're going to pray over him and his calling. And what, and what the priests would do, what, the, what they would do is they would dump a gallon and a half of anointing oil on them. Now, I gave, I gave him the option to um, put a poncho on, but he's like, no, give it to me all. So he's going to get... The full measure, the full measure of the anointing, the full measure of what God has for his life. As I pray over him, and Pastor Jason and I anoint him, and he pours the oil, help me pray for Cooper. Help me transfer the same anointing that is in you to him so that he can help us carry on the gospel. So stretch your hands towards Cooper and help me pray. Father, we bless Cooper in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint him right now with your Holy Spirit's full measure, that, God, he would see himself as a priest of your house, that he would not, he would not hold back, that he would not be afraid, that he would not, not for one more day stay in a place of complacency, God, but he would see that it is an urgent matter to share, that it is a time for him to be bold and to be strong to a generation that needs you, God. That he would use his voice to speak your truth, God. That you would anoint him as you did priests for centuries, God. That this in our day, in our time, this would be what the anointing looks at. It looks like Pastor Jason and I pouring out the oil that you gave us, God, to a generation to come so that the gospel does not die with us, so that it does not die with Cooper because Cooper will see this moment and he will do it with someone else in Jesus' name someday. So... You don't need me. You don't need me to pour two gallons, almost two gallons of oil on you for you to be anointed. But what I'm going to ask you to do is a little something different than we normally do. I'm going to ask you to stand while we pray. 
I know that's uncomfortable, and you're all sighing, and that means you don't really love Jesus. But anyway. But I'm going to pray with you. And I'm going to ask God for the full measure over your life. I'm going to ask him that the same anointing that he started and he's built this church, that it would be on you and your children's children, and you would help build God's kingdom and see yourself as the priest that God has called you to be, to walk in the full measure of the power and the presence that God has for your life. So bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.